Thank you, friends, colleagues, and young researchers and students. I have come here a number of times, and it's always a great privilege to be here in one of the leading universities in the country. So I have come here a number of times, and always it's a great privilege to be here and part of this university. And I know that the university I belong to, the crisis we experience, and almost a similar kind of ex crisis you too are experiencing here. Uh, these are terribly difficult times, bad times we live in. But I believe that one of the beauty that studentship always carries with it, no matter how bad times we live in, young minds and the young students always strive for great ideas, always think. And under the extremely difficult circumstances, great ideas come. And one of my illustration is, of course, you know, that uh, when Mussolini sent that person, the very creative Marxist thinker, Antonio Gramsci, to prison, and Mussolini thought that he would stop him working. But that's the paradox of life, paradox of human situation, that out of extremely difficult circumstances, and in the darkness of the prison cell, one of the great experimentation in Marxism came, and which was a turning point in the history of 20th century Marxism, and which you and I read the English translation, which came in 1971, you know, selections from prison notebooks. I just give this illustration, you know, uh, only you know to remind ourselves again and again that no matter how hostile the circumstances it no matter how difficult the situation is, it is you, the young mind, the young mind filled with dreams, questioning, possibilities, anguish, aspiration, they create, they think, they come for a point of departure. And people like us who are growing old, but one of the beauty of the vocation of teaching is that although biologically you grow old, but your vocation takes you again and again to the spirit of the young to the spirit of the youth. And I do believe and I do hope that no matter how universities face challenges, some good ideas, some good thoughts, some innovation would come. So with this hope, you know, let me just begin, you know, on the theme today. What I'm going to speak, I'm not going to make theory once again a very dull, life-killing, boring exercise. Instead, what I used to do with such bright gathering is that walking with theory, you know, feeling the theory, and let theory emerge as the monsoon cloud, and let it rain, and let us enjoy that rain, you know. And it's a, it's a very bad thing about our academic life that the way at school, children grow up with mathematics phobia. Mathematics is projected as so colorless, so abstract so impersonal and very bad teachers of mathematics they instill mathematics fear in the mind of the young learner but mathematics is also musical mathematics is also poetic you know it all depends how we engage with the discipline now similarly for example in our higher education quite often we happen we evolve with a philosophy for them. We often grow up with a theory phobia and we tend to think theory is something very remote, very abstract and the theoretician is one who speaks very difficult prose, speaks a language which has no soul, which has no smell, no fragrance, you know. And we make a distinction between the theoreticians and the empiricists. I tend to believe there is a false distinction because when we see the world, experience the world, we see it with a perspective. With a perspective, we raise certain kind of questions. Likewise, the perspective we evolve, the questions that we raise, we try to test that, look at that through the empirically lived reality. So there is always a mediation between the lived reality and the conceptual abstraction and the theoretical abstraction. And it is always important on our part again and again 
to relate theory to experience and to make sense of the experience through theoretical conceptualization and abstraction. This constant dialectical and the creative negotiation between lived reality, experience, and theoretical abstraction, that is very important. So having said that, let me now come to the thing, you know, as I was coming, you know, <clears throat> from women's college and coming here, and I was thinking of the topic today, women's college, I was speaking on Gandhi. And when I was coming, the thing that was coming to my mind, and I've always trusted spontaneity in life. I have not planned it. And I believe spontaneity in life because of, you know, the way all mystics tell you that when you search God desperately, you do not find God. God finds you, knocks your door suddenly when you are not searching Him, you know. And that, I believe, is the beauty. So I have not planned. I was just walking. Sana offered me good lunch. And when I was coming, you know, suddenly this idea came to my mind that I would begin the discussion with this. And it was about a man called René Descartes, you know, and he was contemplating. And let me tell it in the form of a story. He was contemplating, he was meditating. And his essays on meditation emerged. And the point that he was saying, and it was very beautifully metaphorically he expressed, he said that I began to doubt everything. I doubt everything. I do not take anything for granted. And everything to me, nothing can be taken for granted. And he says that I am wearing my dressing gown and I am in front of the fire and I am reading a book. But is it me who is the wearing, who, has, who is with that dress in front of the fire and reading the book? Or is it that I am dreaming? Is it an illusion? You know, can I be sure, can I take it for granted that it is me who is there in front of the fire and getting the warmth of the fire? And he says that doubt confronts me. I begin to doubt everything and I begin to doubt even my limbs, even that I exist. I begin to doubt. So I begin to doubt everything and nothing I take for granted. And this meditative quest goes on. And then as Descartes would say, but no matter, if there is also a cunning devil, you know, who has put me into that state of doubt, that I begin to doubt everything and I'm not very sure whether I myself read in the book. But now after this intense darkness of the doubt, certain light of truth has begun to come. And that light of truth, Descartes would argue, even if there is a cunning devil deceiving me, but there is a thing called me who is being deceived. So there is only one thing in an environment of doubt I can be certain of, I can be sure that I exist. I think and I exist. And that led to what further Descartes would argue, body-mind dualism. So my bodily fluctuations, my bodily emotions, sensation can deceive me. But what could take me to the truth, enable me to overcome that doubt, is the distinctively clear, rational, thoughtful idea, which is disembodied, which is abstract, which is pure reason. And it is this search for the abstracted, disembodied, pure reason that would be the foundation. That would enable me to overcome this doubt and to see the world now rationally. And it would create now the body-mind dualism. Descartes would further argue that I can imagine myself without one kidney. I can imagine myself that my two hands have been operated. But my body could be divided into fragments. I could imagine myself with an artificial heart. But I cannot imagine myself without the centrality of my being, the being that thinks, dreams, imagines, feels, makes mistakes, you know. So I am certain of the existence that here is a being that thinks, you know, that imagines. So I think, I exist, and the clarity of reason. 
and body mind dualism and the celebration of an abstracted decontextualized disembodied reason now i believe together with decker thing likewise there was a man called francis bacon now talking about that knowledge is power and knowledge can be powerful and through knowledge and how i acquire that knowledge in order to acquire that knowledge now bacon with his inductive method would argue i have to overcome all the idols of the mind the idols my prejudgment my superstitions my prejudices all that have to be overcome only when by overcoming all my presupposition prejudgment idols of the mind i begin to cognize the world see the world as it is as he would say spelling out the book of nature as it is without pre selection and pre judgment and overcoming all the idols of the mind then you know i see the world empirically without any presupposition pre selection now and that knowledge gives me the power now to see nature as an object as a resource and now it is the human knowledge intellect science empiricism that would enable me to have absolute control over nature you know and to see nature as a resource to have absolute control over that so knowledge as power and the cartesian abstracted reason and the baconian arch to overcome all the idols of the mind i began the story today with these two stories because these are very powerful stories which have got something very significant to do with the making of what we call the modern consciousness the modern mind or the modernity modernity as a celebration of reason modernity as a celebration of knowledge as power modernity as that arch to reduce nature now into an object of control and the domination modernity as a new age that now would enlighten human being with the science with empiricism with reason and with the knowledge that can objectify the nature for human supremacy now with that developed further by enlightenment philosophies industrialism the french revolution we could see for example what in social science parlance we would regard as the modern world the project of modernity much with its celebration of science reason the empiricism and the supremacy of science as a body of knowledge and it is science now that gives me the power to establish human supremacy over the world now you and i live in that world all of us are the children of modernity in that sense but what is interesting is that that all the modernity with industrialism with the growth of the modern nation states with nationalism and with many revolutions modernity became a cherished religion cherished doctrine and that modernity began to have tremendous impact on the intellectual landscape of the world from baconian empiricism to cartesian rationality to newtonian reductionism to darwinian evolutionary theory and to positivism objectification scientificism and the notion of time that time is unilinear major time clock time and history is constantly evolving through a cumulative stage of progress we are evolving we are progressing so from the darwinian theory of evolution to comtian theory of positivism from the theological to the metaphysical to the scientific stage to the marxian theory of evolution from the feudalism to capitalism to socialism to state withering away leading to communism now history is in progress history is evolving you know my tomorrow is bound to be better than my yesterday 
I begin to become certain of it. So it became a project to be accomplished and the kingdom of reason has to be celebrated and in that kingdom of reason lies the possibility of human redemption. You know, that was that grand vision of modernity, the grand project of modernity. And in a way that our sociology, our social science, especially sociology, the classical sociology that students study, that emerged out of that project of modernity. All great masters, be it Comte, Herbert Spencer, Marx, Durkheim, all were trying to draw the landscape of that modern industrial civilization through different kind of questions. Durkheim, by looking at labor and then heightened differentiation that the industrial society has led to, how a society based on a high degree of differentiation and specialization retains itself. Whoever looked at it through the changing forms of authority, rationalization, and Marx look at it through the historical form of capitalism and its production relations. So all they began to look at it. But what was interesting, and where and I believe is the, my first point of departure, that even when there was a celebration of this modernity, there's a new promise, promise of hope, reason, secularity, science, progress. But there was also an element of questioning, element of doubt, pathos, anguish about modernity. And this anguish could be seen even in those thinkers who are otherwise champions of modernity. And it is in that context I tell the second story. Max Weber delivering a speech in the University of Munich and that speech is being printed as science as a vocation. And Weber, it's very interesting that all of you who are well first with Weber would see that Weber is saying that how Calvinism, you know, with his this worldly asceticism, unlike Catholicism, has played a very important role in the making of capitalism. You know, the relationship between the Calvinist calling, you know, and the this worldly asceticism and the Protestantism. Weber was also articulating about the new form of rationality that emerged in the form of bureaucracy with its abstraction, with its rational legal structures and how the modern industrial society are becoming more and more dependent on the rational legal structure rather than the traditional or the charismatic authorities. Now, all that Weber was saying, but there was also a deep existential anguish confronting Weber. And that deep existential anguish about the fate of modernity, about the fate of our time. And in science as a vocation, Weber now is saying, and the essay suddenly we begin to read, suddenly Leo Tolstoy emerges in that essay. And Weber says that Tolstoy asked a very important question. And the question that Tolstoy asked troubled the modern consciousness. And the question that Tolstoy asked that can science provide the meaning, the ultimate meaning to the existence? And then Tolstoy would say that is life meaningful? Now this is a question as Tolstoy would say, the most important question to be asked is this, is life meaningful? Why do I exist? And science as such cannot provide a meaning to that question. And as Weber would say, now Tolstoy would say, the most important question to be asked is that, is it meaningful? But <laughs> science does not provide an answer to the question. Now the fact is that Weber took this question seriously. Weber, like a typical rationalist and empiricist, could have undermined that question by saying that it is merely a philosophical question. But Weber took that question pretty seriously. And with that question, Weber now is asking now that what is happening with the rationalization and the intellectualization of the world. And it was in that context that yes, science as a vocation, Weber is saying, yes, science could give me clarity. Science as a tool of thought 
thinking method might enable me to calculate the most efficient means to achieve a given end. But science as such cannot tell me what that, whether that end at all is worth pursuing. So he would give an illustration. I repeat the illustration and modify it further. So he says that when I'm trained in modern medicine, I am trained to believe that my task is to postpone death and to prolong life. So if I see a patient till the last moment, I would try my best to keep him or her alive. But modern medicine cannot give me an answer to the question whether that life at all is worth living right now. Whether that person himself or herself wants to live right now. Say a typical illustration, almost all households today will have this problem. Someone, close one, relative one, nearby one, is on ventilation in a hospital and on ventilator artificial life support system. And the doctors are whispering in your ears, 20% probability, 30% probability, 40% probability. And it goes on and goes on. And suddenly you begin to think that, and that whether my nearest one, in a, the complete isolation, in an insulated intensive care unit of a super specialty hospital, in the absence of the loved ones, whether that hygienic death, clinically monitored death, is a meaningful death, or whether a meaningful death could be that he is allowed to die in his own room, in the presence of his nearest one and the loved ones, instead of that insulation of the intensive care unit. All of us pass through this existential dilemma when someone close to us is put into the hospital and we know that there is no possibility, it is only the technicality of biomedicine, 10%, 24 hours more, 48 hours more, but eventually that how one dies. Now that was the Tolstoy question. And as Weber would say, that modern medicine could not provide an answer to that question. Now this is why as Weber would take that question seriously, <laughs> in science as a vocation, as a result, Weber would argue, I know that religiosity used to provide meaning to the existence. But we are living in a world of growing intellectualization and the rationalization of the world. That is the age of modernity. I myself am rational, intellectual, as Weber would say. And I know that how difficult for me, it is for me to be religiously musical, to be spiritually musical. One who has eaten the apple of the garden, it is so difficult for him now to be religiously musical. But at the same time, I do experience taking Tolstoy's question seriously with the growing intellectualization and the rationalization of the world, the world seems to have lost its meaning. And it is this crisis of meaninglessness and the wonder, the crisis of wonder that would lead Weber to have that ultimate articulation of anguish over the fate of modern times, fate of modernity, that the disenchantment, you know, the disenchantment and the crisis of the middle. Now you see that the question that Weber was raising, and it's a very difficult question to raise. And this question now, in the 20th century, a lot of European existentialist thinkers and philosophers were handling with this question. And without much satisfactory answer, Friedrich Nietzsche already declared God is dead, transvaluation of all values. And in the transvaluation of all values, God is dead and in Antichrist, now the Superman is born. The Superman driven by the intoxication of power who would make his own destiny, create his own destiny and make all the oral system, moral system upside down. Now, all Nietzsche's children who grew up with the God is dead and as a result the existentialist philosophy emerged with now that crisis of meaning. And as a result, the 
frequent metaphor in existentialist novel and literature about the absurd, about the absurdity, about the meaninglessness, about the nausea, absurdity, meaninglessness, and nausea. So it's not surprising that if an Albert Camus character suddenly is walking through sea beach and he feels like brings a pistol and just kills someone, you know, and he is in love with someone, you know, and just with after two hours he forgets that, you know, that entire thing is a series of episodes of meaninglessness and the absurdity. Now the question of the absurdity, the question of the meaninglessness, which wherever despite being one of the primary proponents who theorized rationality, rational authority and modernity began to face it, began to feel it, that this is a crisis of the time. This is the crisis of the modern age. And my guess is that, that many deterministic Marxists missed it. But I believe that a very empathic reading of, reader of Marx, a very creative reader of Marx, would also trace Marx's poetic spiritual romanticism, in particularly in his Hegelian writings, in his Hegelian phase, when Marx would say that in one of his early writings that look what has happened in our times, all the heavenly ecstasies, and to quote Marx, all the heavenly ecstasies have been drowned into the icy water of egoistic calculation. And there is only one thing that matters, is the callous cash payment, you know. And all heavenly ecstasies have been drowned into the icy water of egoistic calculation. And it has destroyed the meaning of all vocations, because everything is now an exchangeable commodity. Everything is now a measurement, a price tag. So he was also seeing the discontent, not merely the economic discontent, but the moral, ethical, and the spiritual discontent of the age of capitalism. So I tell these two stories to see that the crisis of modernity, the anguish of modernity, could be seen and felt even in the classical sociological tradition, you know, who emerged out of modernity who celebrated modernity, whose theory was an attempt to make sense of modernity, but they could feel that some discontents of modernity, some existential pathos about modernity. And this is here, I believe, very important to begin with. And with that, when you go, see the further evolution of the intellectual trajectory, come to mid-20th century which Tom Bottomer would characterize in his brief note on Frankfurt School Marxism, where Tom Bottomer would argue that Europe was passing through these two wars and the growth of fascism, you know, authoritarianism, as Tom Bottomer would argue, the age of despair, the age of darkness, you know. And as a result, a series of sensitive minds who were inspired by humanistic Marx, who are inspired by Sigmund Freud and who are inspired by the humanistic philosophies, now they began to ask a series of questions that isn't it that in the late 18th century, what is enlightenment? Immanuel Kant wrote such a famous essay that what is enlightenment? And enlightenment, as he would say, humankind's ability to come out of the minor by minor is that, that thinking, self-imposed minority that thinking on which I refuse to see the world with my own reason and eyes, but I depend on the given answer, as Kant would argue, if there is a given book that decides for me, if there is a given priest that talks about my salvation and religiosity, then I think as a minor. I have not yet acquired the courage, acquired my own eyes to see the world as it is. So the enlightenment to emerge out of our autonomous thinking, coming out of those self-imposed minority. And as Kant would end that essay by saying that I am not very sure that whether we live in an enlightened age, but suddenly we are moving towards enlightenment. <coughs> so that promise of enlightenment, why did this promise disappear? Instead of that enlightenment, when I would see the world with my own eyes, now is it that 
it's now all pervading authoritarian personality it is the mass psychology of fascism and it is now instead of deciding and looking at the world on my eyes i am now a victim of the massive culture industry which bombards me with all sorts of images and the symbols every day on me through radio through popular media through newspapers now this question is became suddenly very important and because of this question now see the change of the title immanuel kant what is enlightenment to adorno and horkheimer dialectic of enlightenment and in that dialectic of enlightenment now the other story is coming that why the authoritarian personality why in the 20th century we didn't become liberated why did that rationality disappear reason disappear why is this mass history mass psychology of fascism you know and why this authoritarian personality so where lies its root what is culture industry how it conditions me and what is the relationship between authoritarian politics and this culture which has emerged these questions began to haunt all those new left thinkers the frankfurt school marxists from i don't know horkheimer harbert marcus eric from you know these questions now become very important and through that question now one point came very sharp now very sharp critique of now is emerging that which modernity almost took for granted that the sanctification of science as a body of knowledge you know you could question political economy you could question how the state works but you could not question science you know but now in the new left you began to see now the language is becoming more sharp and they are saying that science itself has become instrumental science itself is an ideology of domination and with its objectification it is inherently a principle of domination <coughs> as the other day in delhi in one of his lecture ashish pandey said beautifully that look at it objectification so typical that hiroshima project initially the army was not ready but it was a science project scientists were determined that this experimentation would take place and from the above the aircraft you were listening to beethoven the pilot and then the bomb would be dropped you know people whom you have never seen people whom you would never meet and the bomb would be dropped and then they would go back and they would say some trees green some trees moving like this some is like this but the brutus garden everything has to be cut into sizes hitler was a great great gardener Even that all that is an average to be ruthlessly cut, eliminated with absolute mathematical precision, and the design. So it was here they were talking about the mass psychology of fascism, the technocratic rationality, the instrumentality of modern science. So very sharp critique of it began to emerge. So all those are quite preparing, preparing the ground. <coughs> Then, in 20th century, in 20th century, worldwide, the momentum that the decolonization movement took, you know, and the growing decolonization movement, that was increasing with the new ideas that began to emerge, were beginning to question the hegemony of Western sovereignty and the monologue of the Western discourse. because of the decolonization movement you know the hitato subjects of colonials you know who were internalizing that entire language of european modernity now because of decolonization other voices began to come as a result the intellectual hegemony of the european modernist discourse began to get challenges from the other parts of the world from the other corners of the world he began to experience challenges and then another two things happened in our time 
you know, in the late 20th century. One was the collapse of Soviet Union. And in a way, the collapse of what we would call the great socialist experiment. And the great socialist experiment was that iron and steel idea of a surgical state engaged in modernizing the country with a socialist dream. That began to crumble. That collapsed. And with that, you know, the multinational corporations, the global capitalism, and the tremendous revolution in the media, and the information technology, and the emergence of all of us as consumers. And the moment we emerge as consumers in a media-saturated world, then what happens that the modern aestheticians who till now were having a distinct boundary between good art and the bad art. What is good, what is bad, what is rational, what is irrational, they began to lose their authority. You know, many possibilities began to emerge. You know, and under those circumstances, where things began to change. In these circumstances, in this journey, then when you begin to read thinker like Jigman Mohan, or the thinker like, for example, Madhrila, or the Mission Foucault, or Lyotard, or Berrien, then we begin to see now seeds of animal discourse begin to emerge, and which we very loosely call the postmodern discourse. Now, in that postmodern discourse, now what is happening is that that if Descartes was striving for a certain, Bacon was saying the supremacy of science and the knowledge has power. And that enlightenment dream of the reason taking us to happiness. Now suddenly we began to see now with this thing, with that evolution of instrument, new left and the other critic, now in the postmodern stage, with this changing dynamics of the world in the 20th century, now you see now another kind of sensibility in our ideas and thoughts began to emerge. Say for example, if I take a couple of illustrations, simple illustration, that Foucault now, especially in discipline and punch and in madness and civilization, now Michel Foucault was now coming with a hammer and making us think, and making us think in that sense that as he was saying, that you see, as he says very beautifully, that the historians, jurists and philosophers of the 18th century gave us a dream of a perfectly rational society with freedom. But what they didn't tell us and what it eventually led to, that beneath it there was also a military dream of society. And that military dream of society emerged out of a new discourse of discipline and punishment. So in the discipline and punish, when Foucault began a chapter that with two, with a beautiful narrative that <coughs> King Louis, one teenager with a pen knife trying to hurt him and he could not succeed and he was caught and then his punishment would be a spectacle that six horses would drag him into the road as Foucault described then his limbs would be put into acid and burnt and then the ashes would be thrown into the wind and the people would see that spectacle of the punishment, the body as the target. And then Foucault says that after the couple of years of the revolution, French revolution with the birth of the new prison, now it's different and he described equally dramatically that early morning the first bell, the prisoners rise up. After three minutes, the second bell, they dress themselves. Third bell, they get ready and start going near the church. Then again they come back, have breakfast, and then they come to the clash. Eight, monitor comes. Eight, five, first split. Eight, ten, dictation ends. Eight, fifteen, second split. Now he described that thing that 
the meticulous ordering of time and also that taking you know Bentham's thing of the panopticon you know that that circular building with an inspecting tower and one is being constantly observed and constantly monitored which we would call hierarchical observation normalization and the surveillance so the surveillance that how as a result Foucault now would question that and say that the surveillance became more subtle more nuanced. So it's not that we enter a very happy world. Instead now we enter a world of more sophisticated subjects. As Foucault would argue that I may not be beaten up, I will be hanged to death, but if this morning I am hanged to death, the night, the last night the psychiatrist would come to me and engage in an act of counseling and the dietitian would come and ask me what food do I want to eat. You know, they would take my body, but they would not make me feel that they are taking they are taking the body. So the punishment has become more subtle, more sophisticated, more nuanced with the technology of surveillance. And as a result, as to go down you now, that the thing is that there are multiple pockets of resistance. Because this power, the way this power is exercised, Foucault's one of the discomfort with Marx would be that it is not centrally located in the universe. It is a microphysics of power. So it is in the sexual, it is in the family, it is at the school, it is at the clinic, that all perfecting dynamics of power. So there will be multiple pockets of resistance. So from universal intellectuals, Foucault now would talk about the specific intellectuals embedded in different discourses of power. Likewise, Jim and Bowman, in a very beautiful book, Legislatures and the Interpreters, now he would argue that for quite some time, for 400 years, the modernists in 16th century onwards were almost behaving <coughs> as great legislatures, school headmasters of truth. They are so subtle of everything that you know, science is superior to mythology, secularization is better than religion, you know, and history is definitely progressive, time is, and tomorrow is definitely better than yesterday. So they were certain, they were legislating the world. But then, as Jim and Bowman uh, would say, that we now find ourselves in a world in which legislatures have lost that power of legislation, because now, Instead of intellectuals as legislature, it is the time for intellectuals as humble interpreters of many, many cultural traditions. So questioning and challenging the singularity of any meta discourse. Instead now it is like arguing that there are multiplicity of perspectives, multiplicity of worldviews and modernity with its original singular scientific foundational knowledge was insensitive to the plurality of forces, multiplicity of forces. Now the post-modernity would become, in, as Bauman would argue, as a state of mind. Post-modernity as a state of mind now is engaged in the deconstruction of all master narratives, all foundational knowledges all grand truths. Postmodernity as a state of mind is a celebration of fragments, differences and the pluralities. And also as a state of politics, as Jigman Bauman would say, it is no longer that modernist politics centered on the nation state, but it is now the politics of the sexuality, the politics of the environment, the politics of the sovereignty, the politics of the marginalized many hitherto silent voices which were silent because of the meta discourse you know, those voices would begin to emerge begin to emerge but then one point Jimman Bauman says which I believe is very important despite that postmodern questioning of that modernist hegemony the paradox is that the postmodern sensibility and thinking also causes a tremendous philosophical ethical failure because if the foundations have crumbled, if 
in the medieval age, religion gave the conclusions. And if in the modern age, science gave me the conclusion. And now if in the postmodern there are no foundation and truth, then what would be my anchor? What would be my anchor? Does it lead to a state of nihilistic relativism? Is it possible, for example, now, you know, that how do I choose? How do I say? What would be my moral anchor? Now it lead to, as Jigman Bauman or Argo, paradoxically in that stage of a tremendous ethical burden. Ethical because now there is no anchor anymore with the postmodern. Because the foundations have collapsed in the eyes of the postmodern. So what do I see? What do I stick to? What is true? Now these questions now, as Jigman Bauman would argue, become more important. And these questions, well, I will end in the five minutes, accurate another connotation when in a media simulations, which Bhattarath would argue that in the world of media simulations where the images and the symbols and the signs play such an overwhelming role in a media induced world, now how do I separate or is it at all possible for me to separate the real from the image of the real, separate the real from the mythical? And I often crack a joke by saying that our photocopy machines have become so nuanced that sometimes we wonder what is the original copy and what is the photocopy. You know, it's very difficult to make a distinction between what is original and what is photocopy. So who is original? You know, 2002 Narendra Modi or 2016 Amanda NRI in United States 24-7 television channels, you know, and lot of angles on the camera and lot of chorus song, Modi, 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 you know, repeatedly, repeatedly entering into us, you know. Now, who is real? What is real? You know? Now, as in the Women's College, I give that illustration that, as Vadhula would argue, did the common form take place? Now, it's a question that can emerge only in time of media simulation. What does it mean in my DNA, after my DNA, in the comfort of my drawing room, on the television, the way I see 100 meter run to now in there, or the way I see Virat Kohli is yet another century. Uh, and now I see now, you know, Akhar Bhatt, I see Karthik Bhatt, I see Karthik and in between there is a break, Priyanka Chopra drinking Pepsi, you know, uh, and then again the war comes, you know, uh, and, uh, and now. In such a world, you know, in such a world now that this question emerges of the constant media simulation. And that's why one student asked about the post-truth, the world we live in today, about the post-truth. Now that must the postmodern have an answer to you know to this entire thing that we are confronting. Now these are very important questions to ask. But I would end the discussion with a different tone, where I would just make you think, and I myself have no answer to that question, but the question that is a wonderer I ask myself, that is it possible, and it's both a political as well as philosophical question, is it possible to be sensitive to differences without being a relativist? Now, can I become sensitive to differences, but at the same time, not falling into the trap of other relativism and the differences. I mean postmodern sensitivism in order to understand many languages, in order to become sensitive to differences. But what postmodern doesn't equip me adequately that how I engage in a meaningful conversation, in a meaningful dialogue, in a world with so many differences and out of that dialogue constantly striving for arriving at certain kind of fusion of origins. 
I tend to believe that both Bahama, Havanas, and Gadana, in their two distinctive ways, were possibly preoccupied with this question and were trying to hint at that question. Gadama, in the sense of his the brilliance of the harmonic method of interpretation, truth and method. And whereas Gadamer would argue that unlike positivistic, objectified way of looking at thing and objectifying it, I understand and read culture as a text filled with possibilities. And as I read culture as a text, in that process, the very act of reading, the very act of interpreting that culture is never an objectified finished product. The way I could arrive at a conclusion about the Newtonian law of gravitation, but I could never arrive at a conclusion that what is the meaning of the expression of the eyes of Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. You know, I would never arrive at that law like general intuition. That this is the meaning. This is the final meaning. There could be many interpretations of that. Freud in a small book made a psychoanalytical interpretation. Aesthetician theories made different kind of interpretation. But what does Gadamer would argue? Possibly it's an aesthetic process of play. In that aesthetic process of play, as a reader of the text called Da, da Vinci's Mona Lisa, I am engaged in an act of fusion of origins. Maybe Da Vinci looked at Mona Lisa, imagined Mona Lisa, thought of Mona Lisa in certain way, and now I as a reader try to see it in certain way, and we are engaged in a conversation. And that conversation is a perpetual possibility, rather than something finalized, objectified. So it's a process of becoming. So aesthetics of play as a mode of understanding, as a process of becoming, rather than something finalized or objectified. But at the same time, it is a constant dialogue and the fusion of other things. Likewise, you know, as Habermas, I believe in a different context, absolutely sensitive to all those critiques of postmodernity, and being one of the inheritors of the Frankfurt School. Now, Habermas, when he would talk about it and say that possibly, as Habermas would say, that not everything is finished about the project of modernity. And he would try to see the possibility in what he would call the communication, the communicative rationality, which the instrumental rationality has completely destroyed, has suppressed, what he called the system, the logic of the system. And as a result, the life world has been colonized by that logic, by that system. But as Habermas would say, that one way of fighting back is to, for example, try to restore that spirit of communicative rationality by creating symmetrical dialogical spaces, symmetrical dialogical public spaces. And I believe this quest for a symmetrical dialogic public space and also gatherings, effort of the fusion of origins, which are very, very important. And I believe that what happened, particularly today, the way public opinion, and I end with that, has been completely corrupted by the noisy television channels. So it's like that on anything, be it mob lynching to, you know, raffle to buffers or anything that there be a discussion, on the prime time television channel, what it happens? Apparently, it would give the pretense that it is democratic. Because if there is a Shambhit Patra, there is also a Congress representative. And if there is a media person, there is also a professor from JNU and DU, you know, to give an intellectual color to it. You know, so apparently everything is in order. A rightist is there, a centrist is there, a leftist is there, and an intellectual is there. Everything is there. But then you see that the logic of the conversation. There are two things. 
Now, who decides the issues that are to be liberated? Who decides the issues that are to be liberated? Now, if one day, when the farmers were coming to the national capital Delhi, and there is massive lucky charge, and no discussion on the prime time television on that, <coughs> some other issue is being done, and if on the question he doesn't find anyone, he would hire a retired army general and very heavily paid, and for one hour like a hungry tiger, you know. Uh, he would just finish it for one hour, you know. Uh, uh, now, so, things would become like that. And whenever something deep would begin to take place, you know, the camera or the anchor would not be interested in that. And the debate would degenerate into that. So, you cannot speak of Raphael because he was the culprit for the hopeless. You cannot speak of 2002 because you were the one who did it for. So you were corrupt and hence you did not talk about my corruption. You know, so that is the that is the way the debate would finally degenerate into that. You know, would degenerate into that. Now in such a world, you know, how you and I, as students of critical social science and the political citizens, with that intra intellectual trajectory of the modern and the postmodern and the cultural industry and the post truth we live in today, we redefine ourselves, rediscover ourselves, and create a new public culture of debate and create a new politics. That I think is the most important question. I have no answer to this question, but I think that I pose this question in front of this minority of minds. Thank you, Paul.